one. Hello, everyone. I mean, in this video, truly one of the biggest interviews I think I've ever gone to do. I really don't know how I looked my way into this. I mean, where do I begin? In this episode of Director Discussions, I'm honored to sit down with the amazing Colin Trevorrow. I mean, where do I begin? You may know him as the director behind Little Known Independent Film. I think it came out recently, Jurassic World Dominion. Uh, pff, I think it's in French. I haven't seen it. Uh, but on top of that, Colin is director behind films such as Safety Not Guaranteed, The Book of Henry, and of course, Jurassic World. I mean, one of truly my favorite directors of all time. And I'm so honored to take the time to chat. Colin, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good, man. How are you? Dude, I'm doing amazing. You know what? A lovely way. I'm not sure if you can see. I have my Christmas things up. Here in Ireland, we celebrate early. I'm not sure. Can you see the Christmas tree? Yeah, you with Cotton Ball Santa. Oh, you got all of it. Look at that. What am I saying? I'm committed, you know. I yeah, mean, this is, sure. this is a real life prop, not something I did in school like four years ago. But I mean, I think it, I think it helps out to the ambiance when I start grilling you. You kind of look like a jackass if you don't answer my questions because I, I have all the Christmas trees up. So, yep, no, I, I anticipate that. So, I mean, dude, so many different things to begin. I mean, let me just ask you this growing up, were you someone who was fascinated with film? I mean, was there a love there? Did you grow up on what was it? Did, was it Spielberg you grew up on? Was it Kurosawa? Where did your start kind of come from? I was I was very fortunate to have uh, been born in 1976, which means that I was a child during the 1980s, and we got to see all those movies that um, we kind of can't get enough of now, and it become our our myths. Uh, when I was a so kid, so you so uh, you were actually around when dinosaurs existed, right? I was there. Yeah, I was there. Did they have uh, hair? Did they have hair? Did they? Did they? They had proto feathers. Uh, that's the, the scientifically accurate man. I have. I have. Uh, I've thought of nothing but dinosaurs for nine years, uh, and it's been very. Uh, it's it's been both refreshing and strange to to not have to think about dinosaurs every day for the past you know six months. When you close your eyes, do you see them? Still. Yeah, I mean, dude, I think that just happens for all of us. But was it that Spielberg kind of? Because that's like the greatest show I feel for a filmmaker to grow up. And when you're getting Spielberg, I don't know, was it Scorsese you would have been watching? I can't imagine at the young age you were sitting there watching Goodfellas. But no, what, what... I watched, yeah, I, I I moved into my Scorsese stage when I worked in a, in a video store, actually a Laserdisc store. I know you don't have that technology uh, anymore, but do you know of Laserdiscs? It right. was It was like a... It was the size of like an LP of a record, but it was silver and it, it looked like a big, you know, CD or a DVD. And for a long time, that was the technology that we thought was going to take us into the future. Um, and I had this, we had a, a store called The Video Room in Oakland, California that was only laser discs. Uh, and the technology was incredible. And we would, uh, it was the first time we could actually see things in their natural aspect ratio because it had always yeah. been a square and had been cut off. So just the fact that we could see a letterboxed film made us feel uh, like we were true cineas. That's amazing. And so was that the route for you wanting to be a filmmaker? Because, I mean, this is the film, right? Is it? Is it for you? Is Jaws the film that kind of got you? This is just completely every single filmmaker I've chatted with has talked about Jaws. And I had not seen Jaws up till like two months ago. But my my local cinema were doing, like, I think it was a 25th anniversary. I'm just throwing out random. Yeah, it was the anniversary of Jaws. So I got to actually watch it on the big screen. And now I understand why everyone wants to be a filmmaker after watching Jaws. But was, yeah. was there a film in particular that hooked you? Or was it just that love of film you had growing up and working with something called Laserdisc, which I still don't think is real. but uh, uh. It, it exists. I swear it exists. Uh, we, you know, my brother and I, would would uh it was right at the beginning of vhs so like we had i remember our first vhs tape um it was the fight between vhs and betamax which you also probably haven't heard of uh but there was a moment when there were going to be two different technologies that were going to they were going to take us into the future and we had the great muppet caper was the the first video tape that we had and we would just watch it again and again and again uh and you couldn't you know you couldn't skip the different points you had to rewind it to watch it again mm -hmm. and it makes me it doesn't make me feel old it actually makes me feel uh you know kind of kind of quaint like i got to grow up in a in a halcyon uh era uh, when we would just watch the same movie over and over again on, on consecutive days. But, you know, it was it was The Muppets, it was Star Wars, it was Back to the Future, it was Indiana Jones. It was all movies that you could watch when you were a kid. I have a camera that's following me around. I'm just I was about to say, I was like, oh my God. What's this going dude, on? That's, so, I was, that's a cool director thing. I thought you had someone yeah, behind the Yeah, it's like a camera. thing. It's, uh, it's the new, uh, this new monitor I have, which is, but it's, it's also a little obnoxious. So I'm going to try not to move. You were sitting there. I assume there's a cameraman. You're like, all right, so I want a tracking shot. You follow me. Yeah, I was me. like, follow me, man. Come on, get this. What is this, amateur hour? Who do you think Come I am? On. I mean, dude, that's amazing you brought up that thing. Because, I mean, in my kitchen, I have posters of Back to the Future, Star Wars, Ghostbusters. Because my dad obviously grew up during that era. And um, 
you know, my dad's deaf. So I think, you know, when you have, when you're deaf growing up in a period like that, because these films are so visually strong, that's such a huge component of it. And I think, like, I, I remember seeing the first Jurassic World. I mean, how long ago, was that 2015 when the first one came out? 2015, yeah. So you must have been, how old were you? Five? Oh my days, I'm so bad. I'm, I'm 15 now. So 20, 2015 was seven years ago. Yeah, seven, been, eight years ago, yeah. Seven, seven, oh, eight? Yeah, and seven, eight. I old. remember... They had this poster that, I mean, this was, I don't think they do anymore, but in my look cinema, these had posters you could get for free. And there was this Jurassic World art print. And I remember I took a fat stack of them because I was like, yeah. oh my God, you're telling me this is for free. I can just take it. So I had them in my room and I remember I had it on my wall and I fed, and then I, I just, I jumped or something. I think I was just beating up my sister. And I mean, not in a weird way. It was just a, like, you know what siblings do. I think I put a big slice in it, but listen, that's the, that's the joy of art. But basically that's a long window way of saying I've been with this journey since the start. So, I yeah. mean, it made a billion. Is that, is that probably the euro to dollar exchange rate? My cinema ticket leads to about a billion dollars. I bet it made, made $1.6 billion, which was an insane amount of money. And I did not uh, really understand it at the time that that movie was a success. So I, we made that movie and then I went back to uh, with my family to our house in Vermont where we lived. Uh, and we just sort of continued our lives and we didn't realize that we just made one of the biggest movies ever. Uh, it took me a while to figure that out. Were you walking around your house like, am I famous now? Just like yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, because no one in my house treats me that way. And so it, anytime I would get back from a shoot, I would always, you know, your instinct is to be like, God, I'm, I'm thirsty. Could I get some water? And they'll all be like, yeah, no, the, the faucet's right over there. Go ahead. Uh, no, no one's getting that for you. Um, it's the so, same. Yeah, it was... It was it's the same when you have a YouTube channel. Everyone just kind of follows your whim. You know what I'm saying? Like I this bet. Christmas, this Christmas tree. My parents wanted to put it up. I was like, "Listen, all right, I'm inter I'm interviewing a big director. We can't put it there." And then uh, eventually they put it up there, and I came around on it. So they must have just knew I'd come to the decision. But like I said, it adds to the ambiance, and uh, it's a creative decision. I think very um, festive. We we'll let we we'll let it slide. But no, dude, that's so fascinating. And I mean, like I said, Jurassic World is one of those films like. Because it, it, like, without sounding like a jackass and standing up here, I mean, it's a film that has been with me since I was A, and it's been in my head. Seeing a film like that on the big screen, which is so kind of unapologetically large, and it's bombastic, but something I've noticed in your work, even, you know, you know, with your, with your previous work, is that, you know, it doesn't bog itself down in being big and visual. It's very character-based, and it's built around character. And there's a personalness, I feel, to a film like that, and it's packed with heart. And I think, you know, you look at the great filmmakers and they always do stuff like that. I mean, like, look, safety not guaranteed. You could have chose to bog yourself down in the time travel aspect of it all. But instead, it's a film about characters, you know, and relationships and dynamics. The thing that I love most about your Jurassic World is that I feel it's the same way for that. I mean, no matter how many dinosaurs there are, no matter how stunning it is visually, characters are always at the forefront. Was that important? Was that a decision for you as a filmmaker? Did you have to sit down and say, this is what I want to do? Yeah, I think it's the only thing that that makes a great film. I can't think of a movie that we all love that that wasn't you know grounded in its characters. That that, that isn't what ultimately drives it. And and so uh, you know that just felt like the responsibility of any film. And and yet I I do see movies occasionally that I I do feel like I'm I'm just sort of lost in, in a soup of of incident. Yeah. Uh, and and usually which which means visual effects or and um, you know I th I think that it's it's rare if ever that there's going to be a movie that people are going to connect to on an emotional level that isn't just about the people who are in it. Yeah, I mean, film to me is about connection anyway. I mean, I think the greatest filmmakers, I mean, the goal, I think what makes a good film is if you can connect with a character, if you can come out and say, well, I connected with them and I could empathize, I could feel what they were feeling, well, then that's the mark of a good film to me. I mean, visual effects and stuff like that, I mean, they do mean so much, but that's something you still manage to maintain in a film of that scale and something so large. Is it hard not to get wrapped up in the theatrics of it all and say, okay, well, we could go for another visually stunning shot because it was a really amazing blend. Like, I saw Dominion. I, I've seen it three times now, twice in theaters, and I saw the extended edition, which, I mean, is fantastic. So I, I got to watch it three times, and the things I've noticed that when you're... I watched it the first time. I loved it. I watched it the second time. I was picking up things. There was more things I didn't realize on the first view. And then the extended edition, I could really sit down and I could, re I could replay stuff and I could actually really admire it. Is that your yeah. goal as a filmmaker? When you're putting this level of care, is it hard not to get wrapped up or is it just secondhand to you at this point? I, I absolutely... Uh, I, I feel like I know the way that I watch movies and, and I know how... Uh, you know, oftentimes if you go to the, especially if you go to the theater, like you're just so wrapped up in the experience that, that yeah. there's all kinds of little details that, that, you know, a good writer, especially will, will put into the work. Uh, if there's something that you can pick up on the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time, and, and, and actually see 
uh, the intention in every moment. Cause I, I think you, you know, you, you absorb something and you just kind of take it in and you drink it and, and you don't really think about uh, the filmmaker's intention in any given moment. Yeah. And so when you see something like Dominion for the third time and you're seeing the extended edition that has, you know, more elements to it. And, and you understand, I think a lot more when you see the, that version of it, you know, how things are connected and, and how it's woven in the way that it was. And, and uh, I, I love that people got to see that version of it. Uh, Cause it, it is, you know, exponentially different uh in a lot of ways but it, in the end it just comes down to how much you care about those people uh mm -hmm. and how much you you care about like you know the nuance of their experience even when it comes to you know the only the only threat that they're dealing with is being eaten by dinosaurs which is a little limiting yeah. you know when you think of all the threats that most franchises have there's there's kind of any number of things that could kill their characters but in this one really the only thing is that you know you might get eaten by a dinosaur and it's it's challenging Dude, you're you're dragged in with the dinosaurs, but I think I mean, you know, it does take on kind of its own mold and its own thing. I mean, once you go in, like I said, you know, I don't think anyone has ever gone to Star Wars to see the character building, you know. But you go and you see Star Wars, and then you can't help but be immersed. I feel like it's the same for something like this. No matter how big or you know, like when you're dealing with these things, you can you can build these characters up from the ground. You can make us relate to them on some binary level. And it must be hard because, I mean, trying to get us to feel empathy for dinosaurs when no one has ever actually met a dinosaur, no one has seen a dinosaur, dinosaurs don't speak. It Was it hard for you? I mean, would that be more on the writing side, trying to give us a connection with these dinosaurs? Or is that visually trying to craft that? Well, that was something that, you know, Derek and I, from the very beginning, that really became the intention of the whole trilogy, is how can we acknowledge that these are living creatures these are animals uh who are are you know they're not traditional villains they're not you know actively plotting to come and kill you you know they're carnivores who are are predators they're hungry uh or you're invading their space you're invading their territory uh and to really uh you know use this not a, not as a metaphor but as, as a way to kind of look at the natural world our relationship with animals the way that we treat them uh yeah. the way we interact with them and and use dinosaurs as a way to hopefully get kids to look at the way that we uh treat the natural world in a different way yeah no and I, I think you can see that and i mean i think there's a great optimism attached to jurassic world i mean you do see these dinosaurs go through hardship but the end of dominion i'd argue it's optimistic and something i've noticed with filmmakers is that they'll make a film and it'll kind of you'll perceive it as a sad ending and then i'll interview them and be like yeah that that was an optimistic ending i feel and like it's interesting that kind of dynamic but i do feel like there is something uplifting about these creatures and like i said connection always seems to be a hard bit let me ask you this right when you were coming onto a project like this, like I got to chat, we talked about Chris from Macquarie who directed Mission Impossible. He was saying, uh, if if I was ever going to do a Star Wars, he said he'd shoot it on film like George Lucas did. He'd frame yeah. it like George Lucas did. When you're going on to Jurassic World, you have to go back and watch Spielberg's work differently. Do you have to look at the shots he chose, the decisions he made? And do you have to like look at and see what you can do with that? Or what what's that process like? Uh, you know, it was, it was, Right in the middle, and that that I wanted to make sure that if you if you're a kid and you watch all of the movies together, that they feel like they're in the same world, they share a cinematic language, yeah. and yet we slowly started to break that a little bit over the course of the three movies. So you know, in Dominion, suddenly you know there's a handheld camera, and and it yeah. doesn't have that kind of you know natural gliding, graceful movement that that Steven's camera has. But Jurassic World had much uh, you know longer shots, kind of three or four point tracking shots that were much more designed in, in in the way that Steven shoots things to feel a little bit more like Jurassic Park. So in some ways, I feel like we had to earn changing the cinematic language uh, as we did it over a couple of movies. Uh, it's funny, the thing you mentioned earlier, I, just, I thought of a, of a moment when it comes to like a director's intention of something being optimistic or not. Um, that ending of Dominion, when you've got all of the, you know, the animals and dinosaurs coexisting together, we had a, it really, to me, depended on the music. And if the music had been the Jurassic Park theme, the John Williams theme, then that would have been a celebration of the fact that dinosaurs and, and animals were coexisting. And we actually, we tried it. I listened to it that way once. And then even before we recorded the final theme, uh, Giacchino had recorded something that was much more upbeat and, yeah. and celebratory and kind of hopeful. Uh, and then we actually, we were at Abbey Road and we were recording it and we realized like, well, actually... This is this is also scary and like ominous in certain ways, and so we can't like just act like this is the end of Return of the Jedi and there's Ewoks dancing everywhere. And so he wrote a second piece like overnight that we recorded the next day that was just a couple steps down in its in its 
level of celebration and 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 sense that like well you know not all is right yet there's still going to be challenges ahead for these dinosaurs and animals dude that's fascinating i love hearing about you know sound and how that can influence film i mean when I, whenever directors talk about the way a film is constructed like i've heard so much from making comedy films how that's different and how much work goes into that and horror i think like you, you like you don't need sound in any other genre as much as you do horror because horror is pure atmosphere you're building that atmosphere throughout a film so i mean yeah w when you talk about sound and something like that it was there important decisions that you had to make regarding things that people may not even see on the surface like i mean yeah looking at a dinosaur is cool and all but what about the other practical things you have to deal with what about the the other the sound of editing was there so anything that you struggled with there or in constructing the film you know, it's it's different in every sequence, but it's it's making it feel as immersive as as possible. The, to me, the best sound sequence in the film. Uh, we actually had a lot of time on the mix, uh, you know, because because of the uh, the editing that was still going on. We were having to shorten the film and shorten the film, and so we actually got to spend a lot more time mixing the film than we normally would. Uh, and so there's a lot of really detailed mixing that went on. One of them is is the scene where. Um, where Claire goes underwater and the Therizinosaurus is kind of over the pool and that scene, like you know, it, the the animal uh, is is partially blind and so it uses echolocation to know where it is. Yeah. And so the sounds that go up before you actually see it and all the different every speaker has a little moment where you hear this thing echoing off of every tree in this forest and i thought it was such a beautiful piece of work that i that, think uh, that's Skywalker. my favorite scene and i mentioned this in my initial message i mean sometimes i'll talk to a filmmaker and i'll talk about watching a film and they'll say i can see hints of toby hooper in that and uh, steven spielberg and i'll always be like i don't even know how you can possibly see but there was one filmmaker i mean it's fair to say that was a francis ford coppola inspired scene apocalypse now because it's such a great i mean watching that on the big screen i mean like i so so visually remember that and you know you, you, you move the camera up and you oh it was, it's just such a great scene was that inspired by francis ford coppola well yeah they're like the apocalypse claire moment where she comes up out of the water yeah uh, yeah a little bit i mean it, it oh, really I love like, it i love it so much yeah no it, it really uh it was it was it was just the two of us it was really cool like for the two of us having made these you know these three films to finally have a moment where it was it was the first time that that Bryce had been in a scene with a dinosaur and she was in danger alone in all of the movies really? that had never happened before. Well, if you really think on it, yeah, that that had never really happened. And and there's always either someone else with her or something else going on. And so uh we really got to to try and craft something that was, you know, silent, dialogue free, uh you know, suspenseful and intense and and just, you know, hopefully like nothing that you've seen or felt before. And and it, so much of it was practical too. Everything except the dinosaur. Uh, even when she goes underwater, the camera dipped underwater, and she was really under there. We built a pool on the set out in the real forest. Uh, uh, so everything you see uh, really happened, except you know, of course, the uh, the dinosaur itself. Well, you never know. I mean, I don't know really what goes into filmmaking magic. I assume bringing dinosaurs back from the dead isn't isn't too hard of a task. So. We had real ones. There were were a lot of animatronics on this movie. There were more in this one than the last two combined. I, I imagine you go up to the T-Rex and you're like, come on, just give me anger. Where's the emotion? No, What's give me it? something. I, I would find my... Well, because there's puppeteers, right? So, you know, you find yeah. yourself directing the dinosaur like looking the dinosaur in the eye and uh, you know can you turn your head a little bit this way look, look a little curious and then it'll do it and so I, I just got used to it at a certain point where's the conviction in this scene what what are you trying to bring yeah. to it i mean no man i've i mean before talking to directors before i started interviewing directors i've interviewed over 80 comic book you know writers and creators and something i've always asked them is that when they're working on IP for DC, for Marvel, you know, you're kind of being held the keys to something like that, to something like Batman when you're writing it. But, I mean, when you're filmmaking, you know this is going to be seen by millions. I mean, is it how hard is it to kind of make a great film, pay respect to the previous ones, keep inside the canon, and all while doing your own thing? Because, I mean, people, like, it always baffles me how people like you can do it. And you can make these just amazingly written, amazing character-driven, you know, films. And it's still respectful of everything. Is that hard for you? Or can be, I assume when you're doing the first one, it would have been a little bit harder, but maybe by the third one, you've gotten a bit better at it. I mean, is am I right there? Or what's that like? I, you know, was, I was weirdly like more confident with the first one than I was with the other two. Really? For some reason, I, I was so, I just knew how to do it. Uh, and I, I knew what the movie needed to be. And at every step, I, I had this confidence that I've never had since. Uh, I think you get less confident with every movie as opposed to more. Because uh, you just realize how many different 
avenues there are that you can travel like every every single shot there it's like a nail with like 50 red strings traveling from and you can choose which one but there's so yeah. many different op options of what you can do and uh so i think by the time i got to this uh i was i was you know, a shell of, of the, the confident brash young man that I was when I did Jurassic world. And it was constantly like, well, I don't know, what should we do? How about this? We could try this, uh, which is probably a good place to be. Like, you, you know, you just become much more collaborative and uh, uh, you, you know, you follow your instincts, but you also know that it's, it's possible to be wrong. Uh, I mean, you know, let's just, let's just get a bit nerdy. Who are some of your filmmaking heroes? Who are some people that inspire you? Is it the main guys? Is it Spielberg? Is it, the, is it that crew? Who, who are some of your filmmaking heroes? It's all those guys. And, and, you know, of course and then the but the movies that um when i think back on the past like 15 20 years like the movies that i just completely freaked out about and just thought were absolutely incredible um are, are often really small films I, I remember this movie chuck and buck that i i just like blew my mind have you ever seen that movie no who directs it it's incredible mike white wrote it uh, and it was it was, it was like a five hundred thousand dollar three hundred thousand dollar indie film, and what he did in that movie with that script and with that character uh, just broke my brain. I couldn't believe it. It made me kind of rethink. Uh, it really inspired Safety Not Guaranteed because it, it just made me rethink what a movie could be. Uh, there was a movie um, called Brigsby Bear that was made about ten, uh, six seven years ago. Have you seen that movie? No. Who directs that one? You're you're throwing uh, out all these great names. You got to see this movie. It's great. Uh, and it's, it's, um, I, I don't want to ruin it for you, but it's, it's about a, a, a kid uh, who, who realizes all that the cops show up at his house and basically tell him, listen, you were, you were kidnapped when you were very young, when you were a little baby and your parents are not your parents. They're actually the leaders of this cult. And they've been teaching you everything that you uh, know, based uh, via this, this kind of TV show they make starring this, this kind of stuffed bear. And actually it was all made to, to teach you their crazy beliefs. We're going to put you back with your real family who haven't seen the kid for like 25 years. And the kid uh, starts wondering, well, when's the next episode of my show going to be on? And like, well, the, there is no show. Your parents were crazy. Uh, and yeah. the show it doesn't exist. And so it's about him making friends and making the the season finale of this show that he grew up watching that actually didn't exist. That was made by his parents to indoctrinate him into their, their weird religion. The, I love films. Like it sounds so weird. I have to watch it. I mean, I love films like that where it's just like, you couldn't predict it. You couldn't write it. There's no, like you can't even see where I came from something like that. I mean, that's right up my alley, man. That's fantastic. It's great. It's all uh, Saturday night live guy. Dave McCary, who's a director who worked at Saturday night live and all of those guys and it's it's amazing so but that's kind of the, my point is that it's a lot of the films that have uh just completely blown my mind were you know relatively small were safety not guaranteed in size and when i hear people uh say that that movie inspired them uh i understand why like there's something about how a, a really small movie uh shows you what's possible in a way that that big movies don't and I think it's a great, it forces you to be creative almost, you know, and I think there's something really fascinating about that. Let me ask you, is there any films you've seen recently that you think people should go watch anything? I mean, I don't know if you've gotten to go to the cinema much, but I, like it can be a film from the 80s, it can be a film from the 40s, film from two weeks ago. Is there a film recently you feel people should go check out? You know what I thought was the best movie that I saw this year was um, the Rescue Rangers Chippendale movie. Did yeah, <laughs> really, that man. movie's incredible. Really? <laughs> I, I mean, that's I, that's the first time I've heard that, you know, for this year. Yeah, dude, man, honestly. That's that a movie really... was unbelievable. Yeah? I, I just think, it, it, to me, it was up there. I think Lego Movie is, is one of the great... Uh, animated comedies of all time and and it was it was just to me that level of of just ingenious brilliant brilliant comedy i thought it was so great yeah man before i let you go my last couple of questions i'm, I'm sorry for taking up so much your time let me just ask you this is there a genre you'd love to tackle that you have yet to and i mean let me just say this is it western um maybe there's Everyone a bit, i did, I did a little western. bit of western and I kind of got it out of my system in Jurassic because we got to do horses and yeah, and that, yeah, yeah, that is a western. That's right. Yeah, you can say that's it. your western with dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd love to do. I, you know, a musical would be cool. Uh, really? I How come do, that comes up so much? A musical. It's just so cinematic. Like, there's something like there's something so joyous whenever uh, you're watching a musical sequence. Uh, you feel joy that's almost impossible to replicate. You know, with any other uh, kind of genre um i really want to do a, a a different kind of submarine thriller uh which i it's actually something i'm working on um and i really want i'm really excited about um 
you know, Atlantis. That's what I've been obsessed about since I was very young is yeah. uh, not like the underwater world with like tritons and magic and stuff, but like the fact that we had a civilization once that had technology and, and flight and, and, and power and weapons and, and it all fell apart and it all fell into the sea. And, and it's to me just like the most fascinating idea that this happens in cycles, you know, that, that yeah. we have huge civilizations every 12,000 years that just keep going and going. I love it. Yeah, I think the Western's making a resurgence, to be honest. I mean, I think you see it now. I mean, there was, I think there was a death of a Western back in 1980s, 70s. I mean, once John Wayne kicked the book out, I think they stopped doing them, to be honest. So when, yeah. sometime after that, I think the Western. But now it seems to be making a resurgence. It seems to be a very popular genre. But I mean, I'm glad you got that. And you got to do a Western with dinosaurs. Could you possibly ask for more as a filmmaker? That's, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, I, I'd love to do. I've I've got a Western thing I'm working on as well with with this guy Seth Graham Smith, who's a really smart writer. And um, look, any anything that if if we can find a way to to make characters that we really care about uh, in any of these worlds, like I'll want to do it. That's always the hard part. Would you do you have a superhero film in you, or are you just are you happy to take a break from franchises with Jurassic World? I don't think so. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'll if I would do another. I think I may be uh, at at the end of my time doing, um, how would I say it? Uh, things that have fans who are currently alive. Yeah. Uh, does that <laughs> like maybe fans who are no longer with us? Uh, but I, as a fan myself of so many things, I understand how passionate you can get about it. And so if you, if you take that on, uh, that's why I have a gray beard now because I took on something that people deeply love. And when you take, when you do that, uh, you, you accept that some, some people, especially a younger generation is going to really love what you do. And, uh, other people are going to really dislike what you do. And you're going to have to, to take all of that on and, and, and put it on your shoulders and try to march forward. But it, it weighs down heavily on a, on a human. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know if I have it in me. I mean, dude, look, the fact that, I mean, your films have come all the way to Ireland. And I mean, the fact that I got to watch a film you've done and like, what was it? It was eight years ago we said, yeah, the fact I got something like that, the fact I got to watch a film like that and now I've gone chat with filmmaking. I mean, dude, you're one of the busiest guys in the world. And the fact that you've took the time to chat with me, it does not go over my head. I'm so grateful, sir. My my last couple of questions, I mean, with Dominion, what was it like bringing, you know, these, these characters from the old films and blending it with the new and still producing a great original film? I mean, how did you, how did you pull that off? It was hard. It was really hard. And, and it just took, uh, forming relationships with these people who have, have known these characters since I was very young. You know, Laura Dern knows Ellie Sattler better than I ever could. And yeah. just trusting that they were authorities on their characters and that they knew them uh, deeply and, and asking them questions about how they would feel and, and how they would react to a new world. And, and so we built it together. We were all in a hotel together uh, during COVID and we were, we were living quarantine for four months. And so we got to spend all of this time together and eat meals together and play Frisbee outside and, uh, and then, you know, it was like putting on a show in the barn, you know, putting on a play. Yeah. I mean, man, that sounds amazing. And I mean, the fact you've gotten to work on all these great worlds, what's next for you? Do you feel like you're going to do something smaller scale? Is that the goal? I mean, is there any projects I, I don't really, there's nothing you can really talk about, right? Is there anything you can really promote or people? Nothing can... I can promote. Well, you know, I, I, I might do that Atlantis thing. Like that's, that's real. Uh, <laughs> so we're working on that. Uh, yeah, there's, you know, I, I, I like that. You know, it's it's a moment where it is really hard to get original uh, pieces done in Hollywood. Like you know, it's it's IP driven, and, and having done a piece of IP, I, I am really motivated to to do something original and really try to to you know create new franchises as opposed to to relying on the ones that we've loved since we were young. And uh, there's not a lot of people who who um, honestly like these these big studios are going to trust creating new franchises uh, yeah, uh, without the yeah. experience doing it uh, and so if, if someone will trust me to do it i want to take advantage of that trust and try not to let them down and, and hopefully make something new dude i mean yeah i think if anyone could do it it has been you because you've proven you can do something i mean like even your smaller scale films have such a great heart to it and you, i never fail to connect with them from dinosaurs you know to, to kids to time travel to all these amazing things that you can do in film i mean you've truly done so much and it's been such a pleasure channel with you my last couple of questions what advice would you have for anyone looking to become a filmmaker oh man i mean it's it's from a generational standpoint it's so different you know than when i was a kid 
Uh, you know, we didn't have any equipment. You know, I was I was editing yeah. from VHS tape to VHS tape. You know, it was all impossible. And now, like you know, you can go take this and go make yeah. a whole movie, and and it's it's absolutely unbelievable. You know what you're capable of. So, I think that your generation is going to tell us, you know, how to do this from here on out. I think, you know, I think TikTok's amazing. I think it's brilliant and hilarious and and to be able to to use that medium to communicate in different ways i think will in a lot of ways educate us on what the future is going to be it's not going to come from me dude that's amazing i think soderbergh did a full two-hour film shooting on phone i think he called it i think it's insane but i mean in yeah. fairness soderbergh makes a film every two weeks that fella is just i mean he's a different grade He's a yeah, different exactly. gravy from the rest of us. But, dude, I mean, getting to chat with you is like getting to chat with Spielberg in the 80s. Like, I mean, you're one of the biggest, like, directors in the world, and you took the time to come on to my silly little show. I mean, what a pleasure it's been chatting with you, sir. I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to come on. I mean, my man, Donna, my sister, Katie, my dad, Simon, me, Daniel, all went to the cinema to see Jurassic World, and it's been such a huge part of my life. And the fact that someone, like, you've been so kind and replying to me and actually taking the time, it's something that does not go over my head. Uh, before we finish up, are you on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter? Can people go follow you? Sure. I, I don't go to Facebook m uh, much at all anymore, but I'm on the other two. I'm around. Is it just That's Colin? just my last name, Trevorrow. Dude, amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time. Chami, anything you can promote? Um, I, man, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just in here working hard. I'm, I'm, uh, I actually wrote a, I wrote a screenplay on spec for the first time, uh, really? in a long time. Yeah. And, and I, you know, for my friend, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard and I, um, I, I just want to stay on the field, you know, I don't want to become a supervisor. I want to stay in there and keep writing and keep working. So that's what I'm going to do. Well, listen, man, there's no better man to do it. Uh, everyone, thank you guys so much for watching. You can go follow me over on Twitter if you'd like, Daniel Fee 33 uh, As always, please make sure to donate to the National Deaf Journalist Society if you have the means. But yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Colin, truly again, sir, it's been such an honor. Have a fantastic day. I'll talk to you a little bit off air. But yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. This has been an interview with one of my directing heroes. Uh, yeah, stay safe, everyone. I'll see you later. Bye.